Okay, so what's this video all about? Well, we've talked a lot about the realms of God's love, you know, the depths of his forgiveness and the extent of his long-suffering mercy. But what we don't like to talk about are the details of what he said to do to fight off evil in a fallen world. Many folks have this idea that God's word preaches only peace and instructs passivity towards evil. Many Christians even feel that violence is never, ever warranted in any circumstance and that the very idea of being armed shows a lack of trust in God and an ill will towards other men. Now, if a guy just sits down, you can read from cover to cover how the Bible is filled with combat. It's the good guys versus the bad guys. It's impossible to uh, miss that if you actually read through the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, God's people are charged with the responsibility to protect that which is good and to fight off all that that is evil. How God's people have fought this evil in the past has been clearly recorded in the scriptures. How God himself has uh, dealt with this evil in the past is even more sobering than uh, how he's had us do it. And uh, some folks even think that Messiah, who, when he came down, changed all this and uh, preached pacifism. However, when it comes to reading about what Messiah actually said and did on certain things, uh, particularly what he would do with evil when he returns in glory, a lot of preachers frantically slam the good book shut and open the hymnal up and distract you with a much more milk toast and lukewarm experience to keep you out of there. Now, was the Bible written by a bunch of passive, fluffy, white-robed hippies, pacifists, or was it written by powerful men of God who weren't scared to stand for truth and justice, even if it meant a scuffle? That's the question that we're going to answer in this video, hopefully, okay? Now, uh, we're not trying to be uh, argumentative here but we just want to get to the actual truth of the context of reality of the world. Now, it's true we live in a fallen world, and in a perfect, uncorrupted, sinless world, combat and fighting and all these things would definitely uh, not be necessary. Everyone remembers how God chose to deal with evil in the uh, first world, when it was corrupted beyond repair, and the consequences of how he chose to deal with it were very hardcore. Pretty much everything had to die and start over. Okay. Now in Genesis, we can also read how Abraham had to uh, deal with evil and uh, how what God, what his views on how Abraham dealt with that evil were. So by reading the scriptures and reading these different stories of uh, how these different things were dealt with and God's response, we can actually know what his views are on the topic. We don't have to guess and fill in the blanks of what we think God ought to think. We can read what he did say about these certain circumstances that did occur historically. So in Genesis, we read the story of how Abraham rescued his nephew Lot from the Mesopotamians who uh, sacked the, the Valley of Sedim, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah down there. And uh, they, they ransacked those villages and they took Lot captive, okay? A lot of people read fast over this one. But when, Ra when Abram heard that Lot had been taken captive, captive, he got extremely angry and he called out 318 specially trained men who were born in his household and uh, they went in pursuit of these guys as far as Dan. Now, when it talks about these 318 trained men, that's something, that's a detail a lot of folks miss. And uh, if, if you read the story, it starts to pop out here. But the trained men in, in Hebrew is the, the term hanik or hanik. And uh, that means armed retainer. And if you read Hamilton's notes on that, that term applies to a slave or a servant whose major function is to provide military assistance. These aren't just hillbilly shepherds who grabbed a stick and headed out to stumble around. These were well-trained warriors capable of making a successful attack against imposing odds. 
And if you read the story, Abraham divided his special forces group into several units and orchestrated a very effective night attack on these guys. And they caused this maximum confusion amongst the enemy. And not only they killed a bunch of guys and won the battle, but they took all their stuff, if you read the story. So they had spoils on top of it, uh, including Lot, of course. They did get Lot back. But uh, what was God's response to this? This would have been a perfect place in the scriptures for God to uh, interdict and say, hey, you're out of line, you know, turn the other cheek, Abraham. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. But when we look in the scriptures here, when Abraham met the high priest Melchizedek, he gave him a tenth of the spoils that they took from those guys they killed to honor God who helped them have victory. And if you read here, it says that Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of the, the Most High God, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God the Most High, creator of the heaven and the earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So what's the deal here? Why did Melchizedek bless Abraham after this violent ordeal? This would have been the perfect opportunity to scold him for taking matters into his own hands and for not having the patience to just trust in God. Well, Abraham did trust God as he charged into the enemy's camp with guns blazing. And God delivered his enemies into Abraham's hands to be killed. So if you've ever really read the Bible, you will know that the story was not an isolated incident. All throughout the scriptures, we see God's people engaged in full-on combat with real live evil, defeating their enemies. Now, when they had their hearts in the right place with the Father in heaven. Sometimes the combat turned out otherwise, and Israel went into captivity. That was because their hearts had fallen out of line with him, and they didn't win. So it's not that combat's the end-all solution. That's not the solution at all. But through that mechanism, God can either vindicate you and liberate you, or he can put you into captivity to correct you. So what about Moses? Well, he was really tight with the Creator, right? I mean, he saw firsthand the power of God to deliver his people from evil, splitting the Red Sea, all that stuff. Yet multiple times, if you read through all the stuff, you see him leading combat against those who got in their way. God not only used this combat to cleanse the land from the filthy idolatry that had infested it, but he also used the combat to cleanse his own people as well. So, yeah, when we turn away our faces from the Creator, we may not win all the time. But he uh, may use our enemies to correct us, like we said just a second ago. You can also read the history of Joshua and all the other godly men of the Bible and see that passivity towards evil was not how God chose to operate. Even our favorite Bible character that so many of us think we can relate to, uh, David, who is a pretty cool guy. I, I think he's pretty cool, but uh, he was a well-trained Weapons proficient Bible commando who gave blasphemers like Goliath no quarter at all. Now, David, by many counts, has several thousand confirmed kills under his belt after all his recorded battles. He was a lean, mean fighting machine. And yet the Bible records that he was a man after God's own heart. I mean, it, it gets pretty crazy. If you actually read the scriptures, folks, it, it gets pretty um, shocking to some of us people in the in our sheltered culture uh, over here in the West. And uh, David, to, to get his wife, he had to collect 100 foreskins from the Philistines, and he actually went double, and he, he got 200. Now, you just don't collect those things very easily. You're not going to just, hey, can I, you know, uh, that's going to be a pretty good fight. So there was a lot of violence that happened there, and uh, God didn't yell at David for his fighting, God was more concerned whether or not David's heart was right with him. That's where the real uh, thing came into play there. That's what God was really worried about. So again, it's important to reiterate that combat in of itself is not a good thing at all. It's not supposed to be something that brings 
glory to us men. That's not something we should seek. It's a terrible necessity in certain situations where uh, when it's warranted by God, when men have to cut off evil, and unfortunately that takes drawing the blood of other men sometimes. Now, uh, it should always be done reluctantly and without rejoice. But God's people were never instructed by God to just sit there and let evil have its way. They were charged to keep a close watch and always be ready for evil lurks waiting for its chance to wreak havoc on all that which is good. Combat is our absolute last resort. We should do everything else in our power to avoid it. But, biblically speaking, when push comes to shove, God's people never had any qualms about dealing with evil swiftly and uh, forcefully. Now, what did Jesus say about all this? Did he reject Abraham, Moses, David, and all the other uh, Bible patriarchs as radical troublemakers who should have just rolled over like... uh, you know, scared sheep and expose their bellies to the hungry wolves. No, I mean, many would try very hard to convince you that that's what he preached. But the truth is that he very much respected what our father in heaven said and instructed in the past. Now, many professional preachers like to extract these small sound bites from their full context of the gospel and arrange them into an argument that contradicts everything that was recorded in the scriptures concerning this topic. They take his teachings on how we should deal with personal attacks that hurt our egos, and they twist those teachings that Messiah had, which were very good, and he, they twisted them into a prohibition on ever laying the smack down on evil or defending the innocent. Does anyone remember uh, how... How our Messiah assaulted the gift shop in the back of the church. Do you remember that story? How he barged into the place yelling, flipping over tables, and he uh, made a whip out of cords, and he physically whipped them dudes at the cash registers and threw them out on their butts? I mean, he didn't take too kindly when he saw that they had made the Father's Temple into a 501c3 incorporated unit and were trying to make all this money based on people's good nature and loyalty towards God. When he saw that, uh, it was a lot of trouble for them guys. I mean, could could you imagine the Messiah coming into our churches nowadays? Like if he'd come back, wouldn't it be great if Jesus just came into the church? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, that'd be pretty funny uh, for certain people. Now, I uh, totally agree that he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. He made that very clear. Living by the sword is basically exactly what it says. That's, I got my AR-15. I'm good. If the bad guys come, I'll blow them away. That'll save me. No, you know, that might save you for five minutes. But being proficient in weaponry is not the primary solution to all of life's problems, okay? I mean, uh, think about it. Just like knowing how to handle a fire extinguisher is not the only way for a park ranger to maintain a healthy forest, right? I mean, sure, the ranger will use the fire extinguisher if he has to, but hopefully, as long as the trees around him stay green and healthy, he will never have to use it. Now, um, it takes a lot of other peripheral things to keep those trees green and healthy to try to prevent forest fires and all this. Now, sometimes fire, uh, you know, it's supposed to come through sometimes, and it does help rejuvenate the forest and all that. But now, but think think about this. Would it be wise to take away this uh, forest ranger's fire extinguisher and prohibit him from even reading the instruction manual in hopes that a real fire, fire will never come? No, obviously not, right? One question people have a lot is, uh, why did Messiah command us to arm ourselves, but then go and tell Peter to put his sword in his sheath uh, when he used it on that guy when they were trying to arrest Jesus? Well, it's kind of simple if you read the whole story. The problem is when you just read one verse at a time and try to build a giant conclusion based on a soundbite extracted from the context. The basic story is, The Messiah came on a covert mission, top secret mission, to uh, be the Passover lamb, to be captured and slain 
for the sins of the world, okay? Now, in order for that to happen, Jesus had to be arrested, okay? Now, in, but one thing that wasn't part of his plan was for the apostles to be arrested and captured. Now, if you've ever seen this Middle Eastern style mob justice, uh, is not very discriminate. And if the apostles would have been unarmed, there would have been a, probably a really good likelihood that they would have all been uh, captured, rounded up, and stoned to death as well. So that's why Messiah commanded those guys, you know, go ahead and uh, sell your cloaks if you don't have a sword and, and get one, you know, and uh, because he is not going to be there for them anymore. They weren't supposed to be captured and killed and taken away, but he was. And when uh, Peter came to go ahead and, uh, you know, try to rescue Jesus, Peter wasn't seeing far enough ahead. He didn't realize that the covert mission was going down. So that's what's going on there. Messiah never deviates from his father's uh, standards and commandments. It's important for us to remember that the Messiah never came here to destroy his father's commandments that he had written before, dealing with all these different things. In fact, he made that very clear on one of his first sermons that he ever spoke, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from any of the law or any of the prophets, that's talking about the Old Testament, until all things are fulfilled. A lot of folks say, well, he, they fulfilled it on the cross. That was some of the things that were fulfilled, but there's still a lot of the law and the prophets that are not yet fulfilled. Jesus has not returned yet, right? Uh, he hasn't rebuilt the new heavens, the new earth. He, have, he hasn't fulfilled all the different uh, typological shadow pictures established in in the different various feasts of the Lord and things like that. So there's still a lot to fulfill. And what he was communicating is that God's law, as long as this planet exists until heaven and earth pass away, is actually what he said, that all the stuff he commanded before is good. If that's the case, and if Jesus somehow went back and decided, nope, I'm changing God's law regarding self-defense and the punishment of evil doers, doers and all these things, that would actually prove that he wasn't the Messiah, if that's the case, because one of the prerequisites of being Messiah, one of the proofs that he was actually the Messiah, was that he would 100% be sinless. So he could not break his father's law. So a lot of folks who still insist that Jesus was a pacifist, to them I just say, hey, please read the revelation of Jesus Christ and get back to me on that. Is he really a pacifist? That's future tense. That's him revealing his true character. Is he a pacifist? Read that story and let me know, okay? Now, a well-rounded man of faith is proficient primarily in loving God with all his heart, mind, and strength and loving his neighbor. That's the big, most important things in life. That's what your foundation needs to be. Now, sometimes part of loving your neighbor is not allowing evil to rape, plunder, and pillage their innocent family in the front yard where you're going to be looking out the window selfishly from your position of safety, waiting for someone else to come and stop it. If you are equipped to help but choose not to out of your own selfishness, then and you allow them to be raped and pillaged or killed, God said very clearly in his word, that their blood will be on your hands in that case. So you are responsible. You are your brother's keeper. God's people love peace more than anyone else. And they will do everything they can to preserve it. They don't go out searching for conflict. The last thing they want is uh, some kind of fight or some kind of war deal. That's terrible. But when evil forces its way upon you and, and asks you to submit to it, it's your responsibility to resist the evil. So that's why the Bible is not for wusses in a nutshell, okay? Uh, this is a serious deal. None of us is getting out of this one alive. Uh, maybe, you know, if uh, he does another one of these resurrection deals one day where uh, the people who are still alive are just sucked up in heaven, there's been a few of those that happen, and there's some indications that might happen again, okay? But basically, um, it's very, very important not to just roll over to evil. 
and that goes in your personal life as well. Uh, if you're thinking you're just going to fight off the evil physically and you don't have your life squared away in other realms, you're kind of defeating the purpose and actually you're just adding to the evil because it's not a, it's not even possible to, to resist evil if you yourself are a part of it. That doesn't make any sense. So obviously, you got to have love. And sometimes when you love your kids, you got to, you know, use a broom to hit the giant attack dog that's trying to eat him, you know, off the playground or whatever. And is it mean that the guy's hitting the attack dog with a broom? Is that mean of him to do that? Obviously not. That's love sometimes to do that, right? Likewise, uh, there's a lot of other attack dogs in the world that would like to eat your kids on the playground besides just the one I used as a metaphor there. So just be aware of that. And uh, hopefully we can learn to prevent these things before they get to that point.